So a little bit of quick background. Um, we've been around for a while. We've got lots and lots of users. And um, what we were trying to deliver, what we were trying to do is to solve what I consider to be kind of the networking problem of decentralizing the net. That's how this whole thing got started. Um, the networking problem is, let's say I want my laptop to talk directly without an intermediary to your laptop. That's really hard. Well, it's not if you use this. Uh, you know, you can make a network, they both join the network, they talk. It handles everything else. Um, so this originally was an open source project. It still is, although we're at a, we have kind of a weird license right now. We're looking at going back to a more standard open source license soon, but it's complicated. Um, and uh, we're now a company. Um, we're hiring at the moment. I'll talk about that later. Um, that's not what I'm here really to talk about. Let's see. Uh, okay, this way, this way. All right, so what I'm here to talk about is our protocol. So the way Zero Tier is built is it has, um, so first of all, if there's one thing you get from this talk, these lightning talks should have one of these, it's this first thing which says the method. This is how we approach engineering decentralized systems. Um, it, it's an analogy to something from a relational database design. If you've ever messed with SQL, um, people will say uh, normalize until it hurts, denormalize until it works. This is analogous to that. Decentralize until it hurts, centralize until it works. So that's what we did when we built this. Um, and the way it's built is it has two layers. Now, the part in red is the part that is still essentially centralized. They're called root nodes. The only thing they do is provide key lookup, kind of like sort of analogous to a GPG key server. And uh, they introduce peers to each other. So if we want to talk, they help us make a direct connection. That's all they do. They're dumb. Uh, they do it for millions of nodes online, but they don't really know what they're doing. Um, I nicknamed these blind idiot gods after HP Lovecraft because they, um, they, they control the network, but they don't really know why or what they're doing. It's least privilege. Um, and what that gives us is it gives us this really fast, uh, global, cryptographically addressed peer-to-peer -peer network where any node can reach another node within a second or two. Um, on top of that, we built basically an Ethernet emulation layer where you can create, uh, I call them chat rooms for machines. They're, um, they're basically uh, virtual networks and then you join them the way you join a Slack channel, but unlike Slack, it's not completely centralized. Um, so you join them, things, when you talk to things on the network, they make direct peer-to-peer -peer connections as needed. And um, so everything in, the net, everything in the network, including the, the nodes called network controllers that are responsible for those virtual networks, is decentralized. You can self-host it. It can be anywhere. Um, I like to say, you know, we, we host network controllers as a, as a SaaS service. It's one of our products. If I had enough bandwidth in my house, I could move them all to my closet and nobody would notice. Uh, that's the way the whole system works. The only part left is the part in red. So, uh, all right, ah, so why is the part in red still there? Well, when we did the procedure of decentralize until it hurts, centralize until it works, that's what we were left with. Um, it needed to be fast, very, very fast, secure against all kinds of threat models, including people, uh, civil attacks, and all kinds of things like that. And because we are um, a company trying to sell a product too, we make most of our money off companies, and corporate IT people need to be able to understand the security model. And um, if we tell them it's some nebulous, decentralized thing, they're gonna be like, huh, what? Uh, I don't know how that works. Um, we did make it, as I said, least privilege. You know, they're dumb, they don't know, they don't know what networks you've joined, they don't know what you're talking about, they don't know your PII, they know your IP and your public key. That's about it. Um, so the, the key here is, uh, all right, we wanna go a little further. Uh, so we can make this process, this engineering method, iterative. So decentralize until it hurts, centralize until it works, make it work, then go to one. So then you zoom in on the part that's still centralized and repeat, repeat the process. So, uh, oh, uh, it, okay, something happened. Uh, uh, okay, all right. 
Why don't you try unplugging your video and replugging it in? I did that about three times, okay, well, but sorry. it's it just doesn't like this at all. Um, so. Why do we want to do this? Well, one is our mission. We want to build a system that empowers users, gives people basically data sovereignty over their data, and we do want it to exist in a sense separate from us. Um, the other reason is there's actually a market case for this. Um, you know, lots of companies you talk to, they don't want to be locked into some product that, um, that if we disappear, their whole network collapses and all their stuff goes down. Oh. Interesting. This is no longer going to work, though. Oh, okay. Cool. That's fine. Um, better if this works. And um, it would also make us really unique because we have um, we have some companies that have popped up in the last year or two doing kind of what we do, but they're all super centralized and they are like the hub of the universe and control all connectivity and everything. If we can say we're not like that and the protocol's independent and if we go away it still works and we aren't spying on you, that's a really interesting thing to say that isn't what other people say. So why is it hard? Well, um, you need a lot of things here. So the routes, you know, we have millions of users. The routes handle insane amounts of traffic. They're located at, at carrier hotels. It's got to perform really fast. Uh, and what I want as a user experience is I want to be able to have my laptop and somebody in China join a virtual network and we can ping each other within less than five seconds. Right now you can do that and it'll make a direct connection. Um, we want to still have that kind of thing. Um, got to be very reliable. Uh, it's got to be secure uh, against all kinds of threat models. There's a lot of decentralized systems that are use things like DHTs and that works fine until somebody real smart with a lot of resources decides to attack you and runs a giant civil attack. And um, I think the reason a lot of people um, don't see that is the systems that they're running are not juicy targets. Um, this is a juicy target. So uh, <laughs> we will be, actually we are attacked all the time. So um, it's gotta be very secure. Um, the next thing is, okay, you know, we could just make something you can self-host that lets you create virtual networks, but then you lose that zero config experience of, I install zero tier, somebody else does, we join the same network and it just works. Um, I wanna still have that, even if uh, we're using different routes. So, and then the next one is, you know, you gotta be able to explain this to an enterprise IT security person and they have to be able to reason about it. And, you know, it's, um, that's a lot of things, and that's very hard to do. So we're looking at two approaches to do this. One of them is uh, full replication, and the other is federation. So the full replication thing, um, there's actually an innovation in the cryptocurrency space that has nothing to do with consensus. Um, it's uh, one of the first things I actually noticed about Bitcoin. I kind of did a double take, and I was like, this was back in like 20, 2009, I'm like, wait a minute, every single transaction is recorded on all the nodes? And then I did the math and I'm like, well, storage is really cheap, that's fine. Um, full replication is that idea. It's you just replicate the entire effing data set. Uh, and uh, there's ways to do this um, with varying degrees of consensus. You can use DAGs, uh, you can just use set reconciliation protocols. Um, this could work. Basically, uh, the design we have is, um, uh, on paper at least, is uh, every node signs this thing called a care of certificate that says what its roots are, and then it submits it. The roots all replicate all that to each other, and then you can find anybody right away. It would scale really nice. Um, it would be secure. You could say all kinds of secure things about it. It does have some issues. One of them is um, <laughs> there's kind of a privacy issue there where if you're replicating all the data, then somebody can just join that network and enumerate all the nodes. Uh, the, other, the other issue there is, um, again, you've got to be able to explain this to a corp IT person, and uh, you, that's hard to explain. They don't like anything that's got squishy boundaries, is how somebody described it to me once. <laughs> Uh, and I understand why that is. Uh, I, IT security is frightening. Uh, we do have a research project. If you go to github.com zero tier LF, there's this thing called, it's pronounced Aleph, and it's a research project that actually uses a DAG to create a fully decentralized, fully replicated data set with all kinds of interesting properties. Hacked it up and go real fast in one of those crazy coding binges. Um, 
Unfortunately, it's too slow to use for our routes now. When we built that, we had about 10,000 users. Now we have over 2 million. So it won't scale like that. Um, the other approach we're looking at is federation. Um, and this is actually where we're kind of leaning right now. And this would be effectively to make the routes like the Fediverse, uh, not using the same protocol, but you, know, you can stand up a route uh, and you can peer, uh, maybe promiscuously with as many as you want, or maybe only with, you know, if it's a company, they might only want to peer with us because they trust us or with, their, with each other's things. Um, the advantages is uh, routes don't have to tell everybody what they've got. They just have to show some kind of set summary or bloom filter or something. Um, people understand it. If you tell a corp IT person, uh, this looks like BGP, they're going to be like, oh, OK, I know what BGP is. Um, and it avoids uh, some issues with security and privacy. Um, in particular, one of the other issues with uh, enumerating or replicating everything is a quote enumeration attack, which isn't really an attack, but it's something that makes other attacks easier. Uh, <laughs> and this actually kind of avoids that. Um, the disadvantages are you have to think really carefully about security, or not security, scalability, and resiliency. So, you know, the existing network's really resilient, but that's because we run it and we've got them all at, at highly peered places. Uh, how would you keep that property globally? So that's it. Again, you know, core ideas uh, are the approach to engineering decentralized systems and also the idea of least privileged centralization, which is something that we've talked about before uh, in our tech blog, I've written about before. I haven't seen a lot of other people talk about that. But if you try to decentralize a system and you're left with this core that you can't further decentralize without losing properties that you need, then you can look at how to basically blind it so it can do its job without knowing more than it needs to know. You're basically putting it on a need-to-know basis. So that's it. Um, and then the uh, um, rest of the company would be mad at me if I didn't say, we're hiring. So uh, if anyone wants to work on this stuff, uh, send me an email. Um, questions? We've got like one minute. Oh, okay. Yeah, I didn't leave much so much time. So there's another place close to where you are on the spectrum, which is to uh, decentralize it just as much as you need to, in order to have that nice security property. Right. That the centralization can be trusted. Yeah. So yeah. Interesting. Have you considered that? Um, yeah, we have. I I think that's kind of. Um, I don't think that would have a big advantage over where we are now because where we are now is even a little farther than that. So we're trying to actually go farther in that direction. Well, you get more scalability out of your solution. Yeah, yeah, that's what's hard to preserve here. So, and of course, it's okay to tell people if they want to run their own routes, you have to have a lot of bandwidth. That's fine. Uh, all right, anyone else? All right. You mentioned that um, there's, there's a way, I guess, to bring some data together, but create kind of a blinding process. So yeah. there's like a need to know. Is there, do you have a name for that? Um, I mean, it's just called least privilege in cryptography, and the idea is use things like hashes and blind signatures and stuff like that to, um, to you know, make make a centralized point that deals with a lot of opaque objects that it can't understand very much, and it does things with it. If you want to go real hardcore, you can do homomorphic encryption, but that's that's it's beanie cap stuff. So, you know, it doesn't. It's not fast enough right now for this. But uh, sorry, please repeat least. Least privilege. It's called. It's a. It's a crypto and security term. Cryptos and cryptography. Um, uh, the principle of least privilege is basically that every part of the system is on a need-to-know basis, uh, like a compartmentalized classified project. And the beanie option was homomorphic encryption, which is this magical math stuff where you can basically do computation on data you can't understand. And magical math is. Um, who, uh, <laughs> search for it. Thank you. Uh, all right. Let's Thanks. Give a big round of applause. Cool. All right. Thanks.